Hello, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Carlos Jensen, Associate Vice Chancellor for Educational Innovation. I will be your moderator for this town hall. I would like to start with some logistics. During registration, attendees had an opportunity to submit questions for the panelists to answer. We have selected some of the most popular questions for the panel today. Please use the Q&A window to submit additional questions during this session, and our panelists will do their best to provide answers. This webinar has live closed captioning available in two ways. First, you can click on the closed caption button at the bottom of the screen and select show subtitles, or you can also click on the link that is pasted into the chat. And now I'd like to introduce Chancellor Pradeep Kosla for some welcoming remarks. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, as we approach the end of the fall quarter, I wanna thank you all, each and every one of you for your resiliency and for your willingness to adapt to, uh, to adapt so that we could incrementally repopulate our campus this fall. And if I may say so with your help and with the help of all the staff, uh, our, our efforts at, at repopulation this fall have been very successful up to now. I know it has, been, it has not been easy, but you have repeatedly risen to the occasion and our students continue to benefit from your leadership by being on campus. As of November 11th, the overall positivity rate for our students on this campus was 0.17% as compared to more than 3% in San Diego County. Since October 1, uh, we've had 57 positive cases, 25 are on campus and 32 are off campus. And since March 1, we've conducted more than 51,000 tests on this campus. So we've been testing our students uh, and also when available and, on, and also faculty and staff who need it once every two weeks. But come December 1, we're gonna to move to once every week uh, of our testing regimen. We've also been testing wastewater and which has enabled us, early, enabled, uh, enabled us to detect early uh, the virus on multiple occasions and also allowing us to notify and test those who might have been impacted. Students continue to embrace campus safety protocols by wearing masks and physical distancing. And I can tell you, I walked on this campus every day looking for at least one person who I could tell, please wear your mask. And all the students I see are very religiously wearing their masks and being great citizens and uh, great students out here. Uh, and so we also have the COVID-19 uh, app uh, released by California State uh, and funded by Apple and Google. More than 15,000 people have adopted it. Uh, it sounds like a lot, but I think we need yet more adoption of this app. And most recently, two students who were detected positive was because they were notified by the app that they were exposed and they went and got tested and they were tested positive. So if you have not adopted the app, if you've not downloaded it, please do so. And I encourage you um, very strongly to do so. So all of this data tells us that our return to learn approach has been successful, it's working, and I hope it continues to work. Uh, I'm sure you've heard by now that San Diego County has shown a spike in, recent, spike in cases recently, and the most recent uh, positivity rate is up something like 8.9%. It's extremely high. This pushes San Diego County in the purple tier, and as a result, the county will move to more restrictive uh, guidelines that will take effect early Saturday morning. On campus, we continue to expand our wastewater testing program. By the time we reach December, we would have nearly 150 wastewater samplers. Uh, every residence hall will be tested uh, uniquely every day, and that would allow us to pinpoint any infections based on a, from on a, on a building by building basis. Uh, we are also very, very prepared to quickly shift our campus operations if necessary to help ensure the ongoing safety of our campus. Um, all in all, I just wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you. We could not have done it without you. Uh, you've been amazing. Your resilience has come out very strongly. And I think you also, during this pandemic, have become role models for our students uh, on how to manage difficult situations. So thank you very much. And let me hand this over to Carlos. Carlos, sir. Thank you, Chancellor Costa. I would now like to introduce UC San Diego Executive Vice Chancellor Elizabeth Simmons for some opening remarks. Thanks very much, Carlos. Um, I just wanted to say briefly to everybody who's here, I'm so glad that you could make time to gather so that we can have a discussion of important issues related to teaching and learning in our current remote and hybrid environment. One of the best decisions the campus made about 
five, six years ago was to establish the teaching and learning commons. And nowadays the commons partners with the academic integrity office, the colleges, the academic divisions and departments, and many others across campus to support students and instructors in a wide variety of ways. And today you'll get to hear more about the resources that are available for you and to get your most pressing questions answered. So I'm just so deeply appreciative of everything that you are doing for your colleagues and for our students in this very confusing and very exhausting time. So thank you, everybody. Back to you, Carlos. Thank you, EVC Simmons. I would now like to introduce Dr. Stephen Constable, Professor of Geophysics and Chair of the Academic Senate to welcome everyone. Thank you, Carlos. Um, welcome everybody indeed. Um, spring seems like such a long time ago uh, when many of us, myself included, had to pivot to fully remote instruction with only a few weeks notice. That we even had a couple of weeks is thanks to our campus epidemiologists and those who listened to them. When we made the call for remote instruction on March 9th, there were only two confirmed COVID cases in San Diego. But by the time the spring quarter started, there were nearly a thousand. While remote teaching was difficult and stressful, we made it work remarkably well because the faculty were resourceful. They helped each other. They worked very hard. Generally speaking, there were no rules and we made things up as we went along and basically it worked. Now we're in a different place as unfortunately COVID-19 hasn't gone away but rather forced us into a new normal. As we bring more students back to the on-campus housing, return to some in-person teaching, schedule classrooms with social distancing in mind and deal with students who've been stranded overseas, we've been forced to put more structure into how we carry out our teaching. But our faculty are still best positioned to determine, to determine best practice for the courses they teach and should continue to do that. Finally, we must remember that this too shall pass. We should do our best to avoid COVID burnout. We are hearing some encouraging news about vaccines. And while it will be well into 2021 before there'll be a significant rollout, optimists amongst us can see the light at the end of the tunnel. So hang in there, everybody. Meanwhile, the academic Senate is doing its best to the extent it can. Carlos. Thank you, Dr. Constable. I would now like to introduce Dr. David Ritter, Faculty Director of the Teaching and Learning Commons and his colleagues to talk about how to support classroom culture and assessment during remote instruction. Thank you, Carlos, and happy to be with everyone today. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, the terrific collaborative team who has put together today's presentation. Dr. Tricia Bertram Gallant, Director of the Academic Integrity Office, and then from the Commons, Dr. Carolyn Sandoval, Associate Director, Dr. Karen Flammer, Director of Digital Learning, Karen Nicewinder, Senior Instructional Designer, and a very special thanks goes to Joey Relaford Doyle, who will be our Chief Presenter today. Thanks, Dr. Ryder. And uh, thanks everyone for being here. It's really great to have this time with you all today. Um, and I just wanna echo what we've already heard, which is you know, how much we acknowledge and appreciate all of the work that you all have put into to your teaching in these last few months uh, to making the switch to remote instruction and doing that while balancing all your other roles and responsibilities. Uh, so we just want to say we, we acknowledge you, we appreciate you, and we are here to support you. Um, and so we really hope that our time together today is valuable to you. Uh, and we also want to mention we know that this is weeks and so when putting together these recommendations, we've really been thinking about things that uh, can be of use to you in the next few weeks of your course, uh, in addition to some things that you might want to have in mind uh, for you know, longer term planning. So today I'm gonna to be talking about a few topics that have to do with the question of how we can effectively, meaningfully, and honestly assess our students uh, in this remote context, and also how we can promote a culture of um, academic integrity and, and positive culture around our assessment in our courses. So I wanna start by looking at the, the really crucial role that assessment plays in the learning process. Now it's possible that when you think of assessment, the first thing that comes to mind might be tests or exam. Uh, but really assessment is a much more general term and it just refers to any process that we use to gather information about what our students know or are able to do. Uh, and ideally we're using uh, evidence from a variety of sources to give us information about our students' skills and abilities in our courses. 
And now assessment is, is really important because it communicates to students what we really think is important. The things that we choose to assess are the things that our students see as the really important uh, uh, outcomes in our course. And we know that our students align their learning behaviors and their study strategies towards what they think is going to be assessed. And so because of this, it's really crucial that our assessments are aligned with our key learning objectives. And in fact, once this you know, is in place, once we have clear and specific learning objectives, that actually makes designing assessments uh, much more straightforward. And so we can go ahead and see an example of this on the next slide. So here we have a couple of learning objectives that are all written about the same topic. So this is a topic that might be taught in an environmental science class, the hydrologic cycle. Uh, but what we see is that the, the learning uh, outcome is written at different levels of specificity. So on the left, we have a very general learning outcome, understand the hydrologic cycle. Now, while that uh, identifies a topic, it doesn't make it clear what exactly it means to understand or how the student will demonstrate that they understand the hydrologic cycle. And as we move to the right, we see learning objectives that are becoming more specific and therefore easier to measure. So over there on the right, we have a very specific learning outcome that makes it very clear to students what they're going to be asked to do in order to demonstrate their knowledge. So in this case, they'd be asked to explain how the hydrologic cycle contributes to snow and weather. Now, the nice thing about this is that once you have those specific learning outcomes, designing assessments becomes much uh, more straightforward. So uh, on the next slide, we can see how this outcome might contribute to some assessments. If we've developed a learning outcome, for instance, in which we want our students to explain something, then we need to design an assessment that would allow them to do just that. And so depending on the constraints of your course and the context in which you're teaching, uh, that might look like a short answer exam question. That might include a presentation, you know, more in-depth presentation. Uh, but regardless, we would be making sure that our assessment is aligned with the learning outcome that we've identified. And so at this point in the quarter, as you're thinking about your major course assessments, now is a really great time to go back and either revisit the learning outcomes that you have created for your course, uh, or write some objectives that you think are really important, the essential things that you want your students to get out of your class, and then make sure that the assessments that we create are aligned with those key essential outcomes. Now, something else that we know is top on all of our minds at the moment is the issue of academic integrity. Uh, and how we can make sure that even in this remote setting, our students are still completing our exams honestly and that we're getting real information about what our students are able to do. And one thing that we know about this is that students are less likely to cheat when an assessment feels meaningful to them. And so that might mean it's individualized or it's interesting or it's engaging. Uh, but above all, that means that the assessment couldn't be completed just by copying answers from the book or by looking online. And so with this principle in mind, we're going to talk today about two ways that we can create meaningful assessments to promote academic integrity in our courses. Uh, so one possibility here is to consider the use of open resource exams. So these are tests in which you allow your students to use some set of resources. Uh, that might include the textbook or uh, notes or the internet. Um, but these exams, because they're allowing students to use resources, they tend to ask questions that are more conceptual in nature, higher level questions that require students to synthesize information or justify their reasoning, uh, but questions that they couldn't just go and look up the answer. And so we can see on the next slide some examples of what questions for open resource exams might look like. Uh, so some possibilities here, you could give your students a unique graph or an image and ask them to describe or explain what they see there. Uh, same thing with a data set, create a unique data set or a scenario and ask your students to respond to questions about it. You could also use questions that um, get at the problem solving process. So rather than just asking for a solution to a problem, ask students to spot the error in a, in a solution that you provide or identify missing information. Uh, when appropriate, you might also ask students to draw answers to questions. So this might be a diagram or a model or a reaction. And it's also a great idea to uh, ask students to explain their reasoning. So why they picked the answer that they chose or uh, which might be the best approach and why. So in all of these cases, we're getting at kind of higher level cognitive skills that uh, couldn't just be Googled, right? So we're using resources might help students uh, answer questions like these, but they're gonna have to do a lot of the work on their own in order to demonstrate their learning. 
Now, if you're going to use open resource exams, there's a few considerations um, around being very clear with your students about your expectations and providing them guidance on how to complete these exams. Uh, one thing that's always a good idea is to remind students which learning objectives your assessment is intended to measure. Uh, and particularly for open resource exams, you're going to want to make sure that you're very clear with your student about what exactly you mean by open book or open note. Uh, what resources are they allowed to use? And so some considerations that you might want to think about here, uh, can your students talk to one another? Can they use the internet? If they can use the internet, can they post the question to a discussion board and see if they can get responses? Uh, so the more explicit you can be about uh, your expectations, that's going to alleviate your students' anxiety around making sure that they are acting with integrity. Uh, and just make it very clear to students what, what integrity on these exams looks like. Other best practices include asking students to cite their sources, so let you know what resources they used as they were uh, uh, completing the test. And then also including metacognition questions that ask students to reflect on their use of resources, which resources were helpful to them. Uh, these are both really great practices, not just for promoting academic integrity, but also for giving your students an opportunity to reflect and become more mindful about their use of resources, which is a crucial academic skill. All right, so we've just talked about how you can use open resource exams to create meaningful tests and promote academic integrity. Now, if you're not tied to the test format, another possibility that you might want to consider is more authentic assessment. Now, there's lots of definitions out there for authentic assessment, but in general, they tend to require uh, more open-ended tasks that allow students to uh, construct their own responses, but most importantly, engage in an activity that is similar to something that they might be asked to do in the real world. And so when we think about creating an authentic assessment, it's really important that we ask ourselves, what are the essential skills that are required for professional practice in my domain? And then we create an assessment that would allow students to uh, engage in some of those world professional or academic skills. Now, if you're considering using authentic assessment, uh, one important thing to keep in mind is that it is not meant to, to replace traditional assessment. And here by traditional assessment, we mean uh, kind of your, your canonical multiple choice exams. So uh, traditional assessment and authentic assessment actually work really beautifully together and complement one, uh, one another really nicely. And the reason for this is that uh, they each kind of allow us to do different things. They each have different benefits. Traditional exams are highly contrived in the sense that the instructor gets to design the questions and target exactly what knowledge and skills we're wanting to find out about from our students. So we get this really great information about the specific skills or concepts that our students know. Uh, authentic assessment is much more open-ended. It can be a little bit messier, but what it does is it allows students to engage in those real life activities and also gives students a chance to have more agency in how they're choosing to demonstrate their learning to you. And so as we think about this uh, distinction between traditional and authentic assessment, it can be helpful to think about an analogy to sports. Uh, so in terms of sports, if we can think of ourselves as coaches, uh, traditional exams are sort of like drills. And so this might be, you know, footwork drills or shooting drills in basketball, um, but those kind of highly constrained uh, sessions that allow you to really master the fundamentals of the game. Authentic assessments are more like scrimmages. So we put them out there in a, you know, kind of messy uh, real life situation that mimics what it's actually gonna look like when they're playing the game. And we allow them to, to experience what that feels like and have a chance to apply those fundamentals to a more real life setting. And so we can take kind of a, a note from this as instructors because we know that both of these are essential for developing uh, skilled players in sports. And in the same way, each of these types of assessments is really important to allowing our students to really develop expertise in our domains. So if you're thinking about what type of uh, authentic assessment you might want to use, um, this is really you know, specific to your domain. And, and as I said, it's a good opportunity to reflect on what sorts of skills or products are involved in professional practice in your discipline. And this is just a list of some possibilities just for some inspiration. So in some cases with authentic assessment, we'll ask our students to produce something or create something. So this might be an annotated bibliography or a musical composition, uh, propose an experiment, 
In other cases, we might ask students to, to perform, uh, to, to do something for us, maybe conduct an interview or give a speech or uh, pitch a product. Uh, and if you'd like to see more or more uh, examples, there's a really great website and this slide links to it uh, that John Mueller has put together that kind of runs through many, many different examples of authentic assessment, as well as giving some guidance and how to go about creating one. This is also something that if you're interested in thinking about how you might design a, an authentic assessment to use in your course, we would be happy to, to work with you on that. So please do feel free to reach out to us at the Teaching and Learning Commons uh, if this is something that you'd like to dive into together. Uh, now, no matter what form your assessment takes, there are tools available at UCSD that will allow you to implement that uh, remotely. And so this can range from quizzes on Canvas or assignments, discussion boards on Canvas, uh, as well as different tools like Gradescope and Perusal and Turnitin. And so uh, this is just to say that, you know, whatever you imagine you want your assessment to look like, there are tools that will allow you to implement that. And this is, again, something that we are very happy to work with you on. So if you'd like any guidance around uh, what tool might be the best choice for you, uh, please do reach out to us. All right. Now, finally, I want to uh, take some time to talk about uh, how we can promote a positive culture around assessment and academic integrity in our courses. Uh, one practice that's really, really beneficial here is using integrity affirmations. Uh, and an integrity affirmation is just a, a statement of, you know, what your policies are regarding uh, academic integrity and, and giving your students a chance before every assessment to affirm their commitment to abiding by uh, those guidelines. And so if you don't already have an integrity affirmation, it is not too late in the quarter to write one. Uh, this links to a, a page where you can get information about how to write a, an, or an integrity affirmation. Um, and this is also something that could be a really nice thing to co-create with your students. So, uh, you know, this is not something that, that needs to have already happened, but something that you can uh, include in your major course assessments coming up. This is also a really uh, great time in the quarter, it being week six, to think about how you can reach out and be proactive in your communication uh, with students who might be struggling. And so now more than ever in the remote setting, uh, you know, it's, it's really important that we're uh, kind of noticing what's going on with our students and reaching out to those who might be falling behind and just letting them know that we're here for them. Um, so even a, a quick email letting them know you know, if you haven't seen them in class recently or if they're missing a few assignments, uh, just reaching out to say hi, uh, I, I just wanted to check in on you, how are you doing, can really go a long way to pulling those students back in and getting them back in the, uh, the fold of your class before it's too late in the quarter. Uh, it's also a really great time to, to think about what's going on in your office hours and make the most of your office hours. That's a really um, crucial time that we have with our students to get a sense of how they're doing uh, how they're doing with the material, how they're doing just in, in life in general, and get a sense of how we can support them uh, on the assessments that we create. And so, you know, encouraging your students to come to office hours uh, and making sure that the time that you spend there with them is, uh, is beneficial is, is very important. Um, finally, you know, we want to encourage you to congratulate yourselves and your students on having made it this far in the quarter. So, you know, as we said before, we know that this has been a challenging time uh, for teaching and for learning. And yet here we all are doing it day after day, you know, being creative, being resilient. Uh, and that goes for your students and it goes for you all as well. And so, you know, really taking the time to congratulate yourselves and your students for all the amazing work that you've done. And finally, you know, with that in mind, we are here to support you. And so please do, if there's anything that we can do to support you in your teaching, to answer questions that you have, uh, there's a variety of ways that you can reach out to us. Uh, we're available uh, through drop-in office hours on Mondays and Thursdays for the rest of this quarter. Uh, so you're welcome to come in and you can chat with us at the Teaching and Learning Commons if you have quick questions. Uh, if there's anything that you'd like to dive into in a more kind of deep way in a one-on-one -on -one consultation, we're also available for those as well. Now, finally, just uh, summarizing some of the resources that are available to you on campus. Uh, and I also wanted to, to highlight to you, if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, the Keep Teaching website uh, is a really amazing uh, kind of a compendium of the resources that we've put together at the Teaching and Learning Commons, as well as EdTech. Uh, and it's a really complete and well-curated 
uh, set of resources to support you in all things related to remote teaching, as well as just teaching and instruction in general. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to, to look at that, we encourage you to do so. We hope that it's helpful. And uh, we also encourage you to, to please send us any feedback that you have about that website and how we could make it more helpful to you. So with that, I wanna say thank you for your time and I'll pass it back over to Dr. Jensen for the Q&A. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, presentation and, and I wanna thank the whole Teaching and Learning Commons team as well as Academic Integrity for all the, the help and support and the many, many questions that you've answered already on a one-to-one -one basis. So switching over to the Q&A portion of the event, uh, again, please use the Q&A window to submit questions during this session and our panelists will do their best to provide answers. Due to time limitations, we may not be able to get to all your questions. However, we will try to post the answers in the FAQ at returntolearn.ucsd.edu and that link uh, is in the chat. Uh, I now welcome all of our panelists to turn on their cameras. I would also like to welcome Dr. Jeff Cook, Chair of the Educational Policy Committee, Dr. John Moore, Dean of Undergraduate Education, Dr. Jim Anthony, uh, Dean of the Graduate Division, and Dr. Maru Figueroa, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Retention and Success. So um, to get us started, the first question is for the EVC. Uh, how will San Diego counties move to California's COVID-19 purple tier impact our winter scheduling plans? Thanks, Carlos. Um, at this time, there is no impact. We are still able to teach in person because our indoor classrooms have only a very limited number of students. We're very strict about wearing face coverings, about keeping everybody six feet apart cleaning the room often, and our students have been, um, have been great, about, uh, great about that. So there is no impact on the um, winter scheduling plans. Um, of course, it does make the outdoor classrooms an even more attractive option because the airflow through the outdoor classrooms is just constant and there's nothing, nothing lingering around there. So we encourage people to consider asking to teach in the outdoor classrooms. And if demand is high enough, we can work to build more outdoor classrooms uh, to be available in winter and spring. And you see Simmons, if I may, a follow-up question. Um, if classes are remote in winter, will housing be offered for those not currently on campus? Yes, those are really, in a sense, two different things. Um, Right now, only um, maybe 40% of the students who are living on campus are taking in-person classes. Um, but there are many other reasons for students to live on campus. One is that for a number of our students, this is the safest and most secure place that they could live. Some of our students um, are former foster youth. Some would otherwise be homeless or be couch surfing, which is not a great idea. Um, some just don't really have reliable um, uh, housing available to them, whereas living on, it's safe, it's clean, it's secure, it's covered by financial aid. There's privacy for doing, for, for uh, learning, even if they're taking all their classes remote, they have a better internet connection and a private space. They're part of an inclusive community. Also by living on, it makes it easier to do in-person research if they're already connected to a research group. They can see their friends, even if everybody has to be distanced and wear masks. And finally, um, if they're coming from somewhere else uh, outside of San Diego, living here gives them access to our mild climate, which makes it easier to still exercise um, by you know, jogging outdoors or running on the beach or what have you which if you come from a place with snow and ice, you wouldn't be able to be outside and exercise as much. So there are a lot of reasons to live on and we will make that available to more students in winter in a very calibrated way though. It's still gonna be limited, mostly singles, a small number of, uh, a limited number of doubles. Thank you very much, ABC Summons. A uh, question for Dr. Karen Flammer. Uh, when do I need a fully remote or online course to have an R designation? 
It's a great question. So uh, the Senate has authorized the use of remote instruction through this entire academic year and through summer then session uh, 2021. Um, this is an exception to the policy on distance education, which requires courses where less than 50% of the instruction is delivered face-to-face, -face, meaning the student and the instructor are in the same physical location, the same room. If less than 50% is in person, the course has to get an R designation for a remote modality course. Um, that has been waived again through the su next summer. Um, I do recommend, um, we're, there will be a workshop by the way, next week, next Wednesday on the 18th on how to gain R course approval for your courses. Um, we're working with a number of instructors right now. We're working between with 15 to 20 course proposals for future R courses. So you don't need it through the summer, um, but we'll be happy to work with you um, so that you can get that permanent R designation, which will go into effect for the, the following academic year, 21-22, most likely. Thank you, Dr. Flammer. So, um, a follow-up question to uh, Dr. Constable and Dr. Cook, if I may. Um, in conversations with faculty as we're going through uh, this period of remote teaching and as some are looking to designing online courses, um, many faculty have gotten used to some form of remote teaching and want to make that uh, a part of their future uh, portfolio. Uh, is Senate considering any future policy distinction between fully online and remote courses like what we're teaching now? Yes. I mean, I appreciate the distinction, the people recognize the distinction between our courses and what we're doing right now. And so when the when Senate wrote policy on remote instruction, um, we were thinking about what we traditionally think of as online courses with a large asynchronous content that were designed from the ground up to be delivering um, an online type of class. Um, so when we had to pivot to teaching everything remotely, um, that basically ran up against policy that was written for a completely different function. And I think it's very clear that um, in light of what we have been doing and may have to do again, um, we need to clean up the policy to accommodate that. Um, in particular, um, um, Elizabeth and I have launched a Senate administration work group, which we call Distance Learning for Academic Excellence and Resilience, that is tasked to look at this um, situation specifically. Um, and there are many reasons why we might want to um, capitalize on our forced experience here. Um, one is that um, we can reasonably expect crises in the future. We've had to shut campuses down for wildfires. We've had to shut campuses down for um, electricity failures. And so um, having some capability to deliver remote instruction um, basically makes the campus more resilient to future crises. Um, it also provides faculty with some um, flexibilities and freedoms if they uh, want to go and spend some time in the field or another country and can reasonably deliver um, some of their instruction remotely during that time, it gives them opportunities that they might not have under the current policies. Um, so yes, we're, we're looking ahead. Um, we're working with Senate's deliberate speed to uh, revise our policy and capture the experiences that we've already had. Jeff, would you like to add anything to that? I, I would just say that as the policy is currently written now, anything anything below 50% FaceTime is is technically in our course, but under the emergency, we're, we're allowing a significant amount of leeway. So assuming that it takes a while for a reevaluation of policy in the future, for future emergencies, for, for the types of things that Dr. Constable is talking about, um, 
it's perfectly permissible, even with the policy as written, to incorporate elements of what we're doing now into your teaching in the future, as long as you don't exceed the 50% limit and, and you have enough face time, and you, you can incorporate tricks and things that you've learned during this, this whole wonderful time that we're all experiencing. And I, I think, you know, I'm personally, I, I'm a geologist. I like experiential stuff. I want to teach in person. I want to go outside. I've had a really hard time with this, but there are definitely elements of remote teaching that I will take with me and I'll use in the future. And I've learned a lot from it. So uh, even if, if nothing changes for a while and we go back to, to normal or quote unquote normal, there's definitely some flexibility, even with the policy as written, to incorporate elements of using the learning management system to your advantage, using lectures online or recordings or giving students flexibility with, with assignments and exams and things like that. So it, it's, it's not a great situation because the policy wasn't made for the emergency we're facing, but we're doing our best with it. And we'll certainly look at it in the context of future catastrophes. I certainly hope not, but um, we'll, we'll, try to, we'll try to be flexible. But I just wanted to throw that out there, that, that even in the future, if nothing changes, you still have the ability to take some of what you've learned with you. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderfully helpful. A question for Dean Anthony. Um, what is UCSD doing to support and better graduate education, specifically on mentorship standards for uh, grad mentors? Yeah, so I'll answer the crux of the question, which sounds like it's about uh, mentor training and graduate mentor training. Um, the first thing I should say is that the campus collectively, um, for a while now, but really STEAM picked up on this last year, brought together a, a cross-campus group focusing on training grants and how to streamline the way in which we uh, wrote proposals for that and provide support for people who are applying for training grants. Because many of the funding agencies uh, require uh, concerted mentor training, this is a core issue that the training grant group is uh, taking up. So that's something, uh, the first thing that we're uh, keeping an eye on. As far as the graduate division is concerned, um, we're going to be making some investments this year uh, in the area we might broadly call professional development. And one of the things that will fall under the uh, heading of professional development is mentor training. So it's my vision to try and come up with a way to provide investments and collaborations with departments so that they can stand up mentor training and we can work with them to do that. Thank you. Um, now a question for Karen uh, and Joey. Um, how do you preserve live lecture student interaction and PowerPoint and lecture? So first, I just like to recognize that this question demonstrates our instructors are getting more and more complex with what they're doing in their teaching. And they're doing a great job with interacting with students and they're seeking out ways to really engage with their students. So I just like to recognize that first off. Um, second, remote teaching is very different. Um, a Zoom lecture is a very different animal than having students in a classroom where you can kind of check in with them and look in their eyes and see if they're understanding it or not. So what I would encourage instructors to do is to be aware of some of the technical capabilities that you have available to you, um, particularly in our Zoom environment that we all now live and breathe in pretty constantly. Um, you have all kinds of tools like chat and the nonverbal communications of yes or no or a thumbs up. Um, you've got polling, you've got breakout rooms, you've even got things like annotations where you can put up a PowerPoint slide and ask students to put a stamp on specific parts of the slide or draw things on the slide. So be aware of, of the types of interactions that you can have in this new environment that we're, that we're working in. Alongside that though, sometimes the technology can be a little bit overwhelming. So find an instructional assistant or have a student who is interested in volunteering kind of help you manage all of these different pieces. Um, maybe have one of them monitor the chat and speak up when there's quite a consensus around a question or when there's a specific finding that the students are, are presenting in the chat. So find ways to use the, the people along with the technology that you're dealing with. Um, there are all kinds of, of uh, resources that the Commons and many groups on campus have put out as well. And I'm 
happy to provide you with some links on the Return to Learn and the Keep Teaching website about how to craft these lecture sessions, these interactive, active learning sessions with students that will help you kind of know where you can go and the types of capabilities that you can leverage. Joey, did you want to add anything to that? That was a, a very complete answer. I would only echo uh, just the importance of, of leaning on your instructional uh, staff. And if you have teaching assistants or instructional assistants, one thing that's been really beautiful to see in remote instruction is those different affordances that uh, that we have. And you know, chat in particular has really come alive and it's allowing students who maybe weren't speaking up before to really have a voice. And in some cases, chat is like a class within a class. <laughs> Um, and so really, you know, trying to harness that and using your team uh, to, to make the most of, of what are some really powerful and exciting tools that we have now. Thank you very much. Um, a question for the EVC just came in. Um, the outdoor classrooms I saw, admittedly from a distance, uh, seem to have solid tent walls and roofs. How is ventilation being handled? Oh, um, right. From a distance, it would have been hard to tell. So the... Um, the side walls of the tent actually um, they're panels that roll up and they're tied or fastened somehow up so that when, when one is going to use the tent um, the side walls will be rolled up on three sides leaving just one side to be the sort of background for the um, for the instructor and the, and the AV and so on so the ventilation will just be natural air blowing right through and when the sides are rolled up, the, the windows, so to speak, are just huge. It's, it's most of the wall space, but that would be really hard to see from a distance. Um, I, I know what they look like and I can see why that wouldn't have been clear. Thank you. Yeah, the, the additional walls are there in case it rains and we, we end up not, not flooding everything. Um, a question for Dr. Tricia Bertram Gallant, uh, Dean Moore, and Dean Anthony. Um, with the switch to remote instruction, academic integrity seems to have become more of a challenge. Is this true? Well, the truth is we don't know, right? Um, so internationally, we don't know. We don't have any data to suggest there's more or less cheating. We do know from decades of research that students don't seem to be any more likely in online uh, programs to cheat than students in in-person um, classes, but that research was done with online learning. Uh, as as uh, Steve Constable mentioned earlier, that's very different than, than what we may be very different than what we've been doing, which is remote instruction. So we don't actually have a lot of data to know, but we do know that people are more likely to make bad decisions under stress and pressure. And we do know that everybody has been under stress and pressure for the last six, seven months, I'm losing, I'm losing track of how long we've been in this, in this situation. And of course, there are more opportunities to cheat when exams are remote. Our students were used to being monitored in, in the sense of being proctored in a classroom and having other people around you. And it, it's a lot of temptation for 17 to 21 year olds. Um, and so, you know, my, I guess the short answer is we don't know. Um, but we do know that, um, that it's, it's likely that there are more temptations and opportunities um, than there were previously. I, I would just like to add that some of the, some of the things were, that were presented in the presentation are excellent ways to guard against some of the opportunities that students may have. So one thing that we have seen a number of cases of our students using um, third party sources to get answers to questions. And um, you can design questions in a way that makes that more difficult to do. And so anything that could be done along those lines would uh, mitigate against the, the potential cheating in those instances. All right, thank you. Um, a question for Karen, uh, thanks Vinder. A faculty member has asked about how exams are being held remotely and the various options and how well they work. Another great question. Um, let me first talk about some of the considerations to think about when you're crafting an online exam, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the tools that you can use. Um, so as you're crafting your exam, um, some of the great techniques that Joey mentioned earlier um, are important considerations. So thinking about the types of questions that you're going to include in the exam. In addition to that, you want to think about things like 
is there a time limit? Is there a specific set of time in which you can take the exam? Maybe there's an hour or a 90 minute time limit. There's also the question of the time window. Um, how in, in what days can the students access and submit the exam? Um, maybe that is 24 hours, maybe it's 48 hours. Um, that is very much up to the instructor. You also wanna think about not just the types of questions that you're going to ask, but how you're gonna put them together. Is there gonna be randomization of questions? Are there different versions of individual questions? How are you going to kind of put all these different pieces together? And one of the other pieces that we definitely can't forget about in our remote environment is issues of student equity. So right now, students are connecting from any one of a number of places. It could even be a Starbucks um, and trying to take some of these exams. Um, maybe they don't have strong internet connection. Maybe they don't have strong hardware, or maybe they have an, an environment in which people are walking in and out of the environment frequently. So you wanna be aware of each of those different things as you're crafting your exam. Um, particularly when you go to transfer your exam into something like Canvas, there are ways that you can uh, make affordances for each of these different items. You can randomize questions, set time limits, set uh, windows. Um, one of the most typical tools that instructors use for crafting exams is Canvas quizzes, um, because there is a lot of functionality there. Um, if your exam is more of a written exam, then you might consider using assignments um, in Canvas. If you are in something like a visual course or something where students are drawing schematics, you also have the opportunity to use something like Gradescope, um, which allows students to actually hand write answers and take a picture of what they've written and upload it into the system. So the somewhat short answer is there are a lot of options available to you. Um, please do take advantage of our Commons office hours. We are here and available to help. And please do reach out to us via email or let us know if you'd like a one-on-one -on -one consultation. Every course is different and we're happy to help you figure out which approach is the most ideal for your situation. Thank you very much. Um, a question for Tricia. Uh, how can we ensure integrity in testing? Well, I wish I had the, the magic silver bullet to ensure integrity in testing. I, I don't. Um, again, the um, you know students are human beings and, and the, they're gonna make some bad decisions. I always say you can't design out cheating, but you can design it in. Um, so uh, using the mechanisms we talked about earlier when possible um, that Joey talked about definitely can reduce motivation. So I'll pause there to say, we know why people cheat. Um, I mentioned stress and pressure, but it's also extrinsic motivation. They're focused on the grades and not on learning. That's why we talked a lot about making sure students understand what learning object, what the learning objectives are and how the assessment is tied to the learning objective. These constant reminders about learning can bring the temperature down on the um, assignment factory process where students feel like the only goal is to get the assignment or test done or to get the grade not to, not to learn or to demonstrate their learning. So that can be helpful. Um, Making sure that you're, you're, again, like Joey talked about, that when you can, that you're not designing tests that make it easy to just Google the answer or post it on one of these third-party sites, which I will not name, um, that will be answered in 24 minutes or less for, for the students. Um, so there's so many ways, the factors to put into it, but I would say the most important is reducing student or increasing students' intrinsic motivations to learn um, and that can be done by the mechanisms that Joey talked about, but also just having the conversation with students. So the integrity affirmation piece reminds students why they're there. And I would say that the majority of your students are not looking to cheat and the majority of your students are not cheating. Um, and, and the ones who do end up cheating probably weren't planning to do so um, during that exam. And so remind, having that conversation with them where together you come up with what kind of classroom do we want? How do we uphold honesty um, in this classroom? What behaviors would the instructional team do to, to uphold honesty and respect and responsibility, fairness and trustworthiness? What behaviors do we want each other to do as students to uphold this? And when you can get students telling other students, knock it off, stop cheating, 
you're making it miserable for the rest of us, that has a lot more power than you telling them to stop cheating. So as much as you can, and you can do this now, even in week six or next week in week seven, um, having that open, honest conversation with students, especially if you've been seeing problems, I would bring them up with students and say, look, this is what I'm seeing. I'm really concerned. I know the majority of you are, you know, trying to complete this class with integrity. Let's talk about it. What should we do for the rest of the quarter to make sure that we can have um, a fair and honest um, uh, class for the rest of the quarter? So those that culture building thing is probably the most powerful than anything than anything else. Thank you. Uh, lightning round, short answers only. Um, a, a question again for, for Karen and for Tricia. Uh, can instructors use Zoom during an exam to watch students conduct their exam or is that up to uh, instructor discretion? Take it away, Karen. <laughs> so it is up to instructor instru discretion. There are multiple options and a lot of considerations. Check out the digital learning website for all kinds of information. And we can also provide the link on the Return to Learn website. Um, so we're, we're, we're up on time. So thank you very much. Uh, last question um, for Dr. Figueroa. Uh, how are we supporting student retention during this challenging time? Thank you, Dr. Jensen. So like many um, of our areas of student retention and success units have continued to support students remotely. Uh, we've learned early on and continue to hear that the top concern for our students is feeling of isolation from friends and family. And so the SRS areas, along with other student affairs units, continue to creatively bring together students virtually to meet with their mentors and create community. Again, we want to increase that sense of belonging that we know is closely tied into retention and success. The academic enrichment program continues to engage and has actually been very successful in increasing awareness and engaging students in undergraduate research with and uh, with their faculty mentors. The Commons is providing tutoring and supplemental instruction support and OASIS continues to support students through their academic success workshops. Um, another area that we've heard of concern is around basic needs. Um, and, our, and our basic needs program has a number of ways that we're supporting students. And I encourage you to visit um, the basic needs um, site. I will drop it into um, the chat. And then of course, these are just some of the things that are happening, some of the work that is um, already going on um, in supporting our students' success and retention. And I encourage you to please visit our website for more information. And I'll drop that link as well in the chat. Thank you so much, Maruth. I think this is a, a good place to, to uh, close for today uh, with a quick reminder to be kind to each other. We're all under a tremendous amount of stress, both the students and the, the faculty. And so any small act of kindness is, is greatly appreciated. I'm afraid that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, I wanna thank everyone for your questions. Uh, we will attempt to answer everyone's uh, unanswered questions by updating the FAQ on our webpage. We'll be posting a recording of this town hall as well. Please feel free to reach out to Teaching and Learning Commons or the Academic Integrity Office with additional questions that you may have. Um, we hope this town hall proved helpful to you. I'd like to thank the presenters and guests for sharing their time and information with us today. And thank you to all of you who attended. Please be sure to join us again on Wednesday, December 9th from 3 to 4 p.m. for our next faculty town hall in preparation for winter quarter. This concludes the special town hall on classroom culture and assessment.